Hello there. Here we go again. It is uh, Wednesday, the 4th of November, 2020. And uh, it's Mark here, back with Jack, his son, ready for another late show. Evening, Jack. How you doing, mate? I'm really good. I've tried to focus today. Of all the Trump-Biden stuff gone in America, I've tried to do my studying, and eventually I got there just in the nick of time. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it'll be a beneficial show. Good on you, mate. Good stuff. I know you, you always... Uh, prepares diligently every single week. And uh, no, it's, it's great, because we swap notes in the car. I don't have any notes, he just swaps his with me. Tells me all of his great insights, and uh, we carry on driving around the M25 and thinking, yeah, <laughs> that was a good prep. <laughs> but I'm out there doing, me, doing my lessons until tomorrow, Jack, because lockdown number 2068 is on the way tomorrow. And uh, so I've been taken off the road for another month. And do you know what, is, is this getting to you guys? Are you starting to feel a bit, you know, a bit low of it all. Do you know what? I, I very rarely get low, but I just started to feel a little bit, a little bit listless with the whole lot, and it's just a little bit as if it's all getting a bit too much. But do you know what? In Christ, you, you can still press on, still carry on. It's close to call, Jack, isn't it? With Trump, it's it's going to be close, isn't it? Yeah, very close. It is, and um, could even go to the Supreme Court if Trump pushes it and really is not happy and suspects foul play. Yeah, but tonight. Whoever you wanted to win, if you're going to be feeling really low tonight, we've got a positive message. And I always think when you're feeling low and you're annoyed at lockdown, everything that's going on, look up, think about all these things that are positive and think back to the cross. And it just fills you with joy knowing that you're saved, you have eternal life. So even though you know, this lockdown is one month, we've got eternal life. So we can press on and not let it steal our joy. Love that, Jack. I love that. Just on one, one little subject before we delve in. Do you know what, Jack? Vicky, oh, Vicky, your mum sent me a little, <laughs> Vicky, sent me a little text when I was just coming back from work, and I think it was a Daily, daily Mail headline, just talking about black cab drivers in London, you know? So I did that for 25 years, spent three and a half years, you know, unpaid doing the knowledge, risking my life, and it was a real proud thing to get, you know? It was a real, a real great achievement, and I was really proud to do the job. Um, and the mail's headline was that three and a half thousand licences uh, have been lost, uh, but either been not taken up, not renewed, given in uh, over the last four months. Three and a half thousand licences, Jack, of black cab drivers, because from whatever angle you want to look at it, there's been a systematic um, crushing of the black cab trade over the last eight, ten years, ever since the introduction of uh, a certain minicab hailing app. Uh, but it's just been, it's, it's been almost, it's been planned, you know, and it's so sad, Jack. Could we be seeing the end of the iconic black cab in London um, because it's now a completely pointless exercise doing the job? And sometimes I'll be out there in the garages just filling up with diesel and you, I'll, I'll chat to a few of the cabbies, you know, just say to them that I used to do it, etc. cetera, and uh, just tell them, that, you know, there is hope after the job, you can move on and do other stuff. But it's, I feel really sad, Jack. I feel like the life as... You know, as, our lives as we know it are systematically being imploded on purpose, you know, and it's, I just felt a little bit sad as I was coming around here thinking, you know, I know the Lord takes us all through seasons, but this is, this is what is happening now is quite, quite heavy duty, isn't well, it? Times are changing. If you look at the change in the world just over the last hundred years, it's mad. Because before, without our modern technology, things change very slowly. And by the time I'm your age, the world will look like a different world, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the gospel hasn't changed. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. Oh, brilliant. Uh, forget the gospel for the minute. Back to the cabs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> tonight, <laughs> tonight, tonight's subject, you do make me laugh. Tonight's subject, I've never heard spoken about, really, as, as a, any sort of, not that we do a sermon or anything, but just as a little subject to, to broach. And it is the seven sayings of our Lord Jesus Christ from the cross in his final, was it six hours on the cross, Jack? Yep, final nine in the hours. morning till three in the afternoon. Nine till three. Those seven little sayings, I, I presume he said more, but the seven recorded in Luke and, and John mainly are quite famous, really, aren't they? Quite yeah. famous. And I was just thinking, what are they relative and, and, and do they speak to our lives today? Uh, which is a bit of a silly question because everything, every spoken word has has a resonance and a... And a and a help for our lives today. Do you know, what, Jack? I'm even in, I'm even in Hosea at the moment, which is um, basically full of God's judgment on Israel and Judah, um, full of heavy stuff. You know, it's it's, it's not exactly cheer yourself up stuff. Um, but you got me into it with, with my little 
Old, Old Testament commentary with David Guzik. And do you know what, Jack? I was t he was talking about the, the, former and, uh, the, the former and latter reigns and just going through line by line, just talking about certain things in Hosea. And it's amazing, because you think to yourself, we get into this mindset, Jack, that, oh, it's Old Testament, it's all gunfire and bullets, judgment, pain, death, and all that. And there's not much really to learn. And I was in Hosea, and I was reading David Guzik's notes, really, really good stuff, and he just talked about the former and latter reigns and how it, it relates to grace that we've accepted, it, that we've received in our lives. And he was just saying, if you've received grace before, you're in the right place to receive grace again, you know? And it, at that moment, whatever I was thinking about in my life, um, it really quickened my spirit, you know? Yeah. Maybe I was searching for, uh, for a grace for a situation that's coming up. And you read it, oh, former and latter rains, you know? First, first rains in, um, in autumn, second rains in spring, you know? <laughs> What's that got to do with my life? But all of a sudden, I think he, he quoted a Spurgeon quote, which was absolutely fantastic. That yeah. guy had some serious insight, didn't he? And you know what, Jack? You know, in 2020, how long ago was I's, um, Hosea? I mean, Isaiah was 700 before Christ, wasn't he? Can't remember Hosea. He was yeah. around with um, Uzziah, wasn't he? And I'm losing track, but a long time ago. And you think to yourself, how can the words of a man so long ago quicken my eternal spirit? And it did. Yeah. So we, we can't just look at the Old Testament as a, as a place of death, destruction, wars, and, and not much going on apart from that, because the word does speak to us, doesn't it? Well, even tonight, we'll see that some of the stuff Jesus said on the cross was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So even thousands of years ago with Moses and with the prophets, they were looking to a day when a Messiah would come, and they were looking to a heavenly kingdom. We, we had um, the series God Day, and I was talking about the heroes of the faith. They were looking to the heavenly kingdom. It's not completely different to Christianity. Christianity is the fulfilment of the Old Testament. Um, so the Old Testament is definitely relevant. But the first point I wanted to make today uh, is about forgiveness, and it's in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the context of that is that you've got Roman soldiers gambling for his clothes. You've got two criminals either side him who are reviling him and you've got the religious leaders mocking him you've got the crowds chanting crucify him crucify him bearing in mind that he came for them and the crowds are blaspheming him as well so in light of all of this the worst sins thinkable if you think about who they're singing against Jesus Christ and Jesus says father forgive them they know not what they are doing and his heart is so different to ours. Mm. Like if just one person mocks us and, you know, whatever they say, it's unlikely that we're going to think, you know, Father, forgive them. We're just not like that, you know. We'll probably just go, oh, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Smack them in the head or something. But <laughs> Jesus was so different. He is the God of all the universe being crucified. And the people who hate him most, he's saying, forgive them. Like he's so on another wavelength. But... He does tell us to be like that as well. You know, he says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Um, so he's bringing in new teaching, which a lot of people would never think to do. You know, you think, oh, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But he says, no, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So that's the first thing he said on the cross, at least what's recorded. You know, Jackie, the Lord is such an example for us, isn't he? And do you know what, sometimes when we're working out of our flesh and trying to do things of our own volition, you know, today I'm going to do this or today I'm going to be better at that, we're always setting ourselves up for a fall because in our flesh, the Bible says, dwells no good thing. And the way that we can emulate Jesus, you know, which we are told to do, you know, we are to be, you know, to be Christ-like exactly, you know, we have the mind of Christ, you know, put on the full armour of God and go and be like the Lord. But we can only do that by the Holy Spirit working in us mm. and then coming out of us. You know, the moment we try and think to ourselves, right, it's Tuesday and I'm going to be really nice to people today. And then you go down the road, blah, 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 something happens, someone cuts you up or something, and it goes straight out the window because we're acting out of our flesh. Yeah. And the way that, I don't want to make it sound like a formula, but the way that we walk in the Christian life is that we allow the Lord to work himself into us 
as righteousness, as eternal life. And then slowly, as it changes us, we work it, he works it out of us, through us and out of us. And it's only then, Jack, that we can have, you know, moments of actually really liking someone that you formerly disliked. Mm. How's that work out? You know? It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, we are... And, th and then when you fall short and you say, Lord, I, I can't do this, I'm, I'm, I literally, I'm, I, I can't do it, that's when we receive grace from the wellspring of life. Isn't it wonderful, Jack? And he says, that's all right, I know you can't do it. Come closer yeah. to me. And he draws us closer, doesn't he, Jack? Yeah. You know? He's so good and, he, and he's made us for good works as well. He doesn't leave us, he saves us, gives us a, a brand new heart and then we're able to walk in more righteousness than before and hopefully every day more so than the previous. Absolutely. But also in this passage, like I was just thinking there's probably people watching who think, I've sinned so badly, I've done something so evil, surely God can't forgive me. And you see here, Jesus wants these people to be forgiven who have done such evil, you know. You've not crucified Jesus. You've not mocked him to his face. And now he's there because of our sin. In a sense, we've crucified Jesus. You know, it was our sin that put him on a cross. But they are doing such wicked sin. And if Jesus wants to forgive them, he also wants to forgive you. And in 1 Timothy 2.4, it says that Jesus desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All people includes you, whoever you are. And 2 Peter 3.9, says, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Whether it was the Romans, whether it was the Jews, whether it's us today, God's desire is that we should be saved. Wonderful stuff. And there was even a Roman centurion, Jack, wasn't there, who, when he saw that the, the water came separately out with the blood, you know, that he actually had the revelation. He said, truly, this is the Son of God, didn't he? Yeah. You know, how about that, Jack? Can you imagine being that Roman centurion there at that moment in time, with the ultimate fulfilment of the Old Testament literally in front of him, and suddenly his eyes were opened. Mm. Do you know, what, Jack, it's almost like it's almost like he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's almost like they know not what they do because they've almost been judicially blinded. Mm. It's almost like um, almost like the Jews in general concerning Jesus, blindness has overtaken them in part up until this day, hasn't it? You know? Yeah. And it's it's almost like we you, we desperately need the Lord to unveil us, don't we, Jack? To actually mm. open our eyes, soften our heart, you know, and let us see once again, you know? Yeah. We need, that is a work of God, isn't it? Definitely. You need the Holy Spirit to give you light, basically. And it, it says in John that Jesus is a light coming into the world, giving light to all men. So I think Jesus makes it possible for all to believe. But also in John, I'm reading John at the moment, and there is a lot of judicial hardening where he gives them over yeah. to what they've been asking for. And some people were not able to receive Jesus. They had eyes that they could not see, ears that they could not hear. And when you read about it in these different chapters, you realise it's to do with the Trinity, where Jesus and the Father are so linked and intertwined. You know, if you, Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. And um, if you really love the Father, you would love me and that kind of thing. They, they go together. You can't separate them, even though they are distinct. And these Pharisees were their false religion, who didn't really love God. They loved their traditions, and they loved the best seats at the table. Because they didn't really love God, and because they had rejected the Father, they were not allowed to have the revelation of Jesus. So when Jesus comes along, they're already hardened. They can't understand, and God actually gives them over. They hate Jesus so much. Jesus will do a miracle. He'll like, raise Lazarus from the dead and they'll plot, how can we kill him? And even how can we kill Lazarus, I read yesterday. They were so given over to their evil. But we read here that God wants all people to be saved, and that is his heart. And sometimes he gives people over if they're persistent, have what you want. Jack, that's a very dangerous place to be, isn't it? If you've reached the place where I think it Romans says he gives them over to a reprobate mind. Whatever you do, don't get to the stage in life where you are so hard-hearted so intransigent in your views that you become a person that the Lord says, okay, you want it this way? I've been, I've been speaking to you for 60 years. Your wife's saved, your wife's been witnessing to you for 60 years, or the other way around, your husband's been saved for 50 years and he's been witnessing. Do not be stiff-necked, do not. Simon, just before he closed down his show, I was just watching the last couple of minutes and it's, it's almost like we are now real 
heavy, pivotal points in history. This is it. I said to Simon the other day, and I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's stolen this line, it's about the only, only good line that I've ever come out with. We are, I believe, at the business end of history. Don't be stiff-necked, don't harden your heart. If you feel the Holy Spirit calling you today through, through whoever, whatever, just open your, open your arms to him. Perfect love casts out for he's willing to come in, take your sin upon him, and let his perfect blood pay your sin debt in full. Jack, number two. Number two is about salvation. In Luke 23, verse 43, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is a great verse because it's speaking about um, one of the sinners who has been crucified with Jesus. Jesus was the innocent lamb of God. He had committed no sin, but either side of him were two criminals. And at the beginning, they're reviling him. In one of the Gospels, it says how uh, the two people either side were reviling him. And then some later point within those six hours, Jesus says to one of them, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, how does that work? And we read in verse 42, the verse before this, the uh, sinner says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I love that because it highlights the message of salvation by faith alone. Because this person who's, I think he deserved to be on a cross, and I can't remember what his sin was. I think we say thief, thief yeah, but I, I can't think of a verse, but I don't know if that's just tradition. Maybe he was a thief. Maybe he was, yeah. Um, and he's gone from reviling Jesus and then he was in the kingdom of God. And basically he's had a revelation like we've just been speaking about. He realised that Jesus was who he said he was. And I don't know whether it was because of what Jesus says before. You know, he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know what, what they do. And maybe he's had a revelation. Wow, this, this guy isn't like us. He really is different. He's got the mind of God. Um, but I was just really encouraged by that. And a lot of people think, you have to do good works to outbalance your bad works. Well, this guy had no time. He had no time to become a good person. He was still a sinner. He was still being crucified as he deserved. But because of his faith, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. And paradise is heaven. Maybe we'll get onto that later. Um, but Jesus went to heaven for three days and nights when he was dead. And this, I was going to say Lazarus, and this guy, I don't know his name, was with him as well. He had entered into the kingdom because of his faith. Yeah. That is a message. We're saved by grace through faith. It's nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our works. It's simply faith in what Jesus did at the cross here. And we'll be going into more detail about what happened at the cross. Yeah. But that's why we're saved. So we never had time to run down to the local church, get baptised, jump out, lead a crusade, lead a healing crusade, quick Bible study, loads of good works down at the old people's home, and then yeah. it felt good. He had no time for any of that, did he? And it rules out purgatory. Jesus didn't say, oh, brilliant, you believe. Now just have 60,000 years in purgatory and then enter into my kingdom. He said, no, today you'll be with me in paradise. There's no in-between state. You're either saved or you're unsaved. Yeah. You're either a believer or not a believer. In the kingdom, out of the kingdom. Yeah. It's black and white in this sense. Yeah, there's very little grey, is there? Yeah. I know. Jack, this is the subject that gets a lot of people going. Um, paradise. The areas of... Heaven, as we say, you know, third heaven, second heaven, whatever, wherever it is. Um, where do you see the Lord going after he dies? You know, where's that little scripture in 2 Peter, isn't it? isn't it, where he went and preached to the Old Testament saints, that one? Yeah. Does that ring any bells with you? So right? I've, I've changed my mind within the last year on this. I used to believe um, that before the resurrection, no one went to heaven, but everyone went to Hades, and there's two compartments, yeah. Abraham's bosom, paradise, and then you've got the bad part, which is Gehenna. And it was only when Jesus, he died and went to preach to the saints, declared victory over the unbelievers, and then took them to heaven. I've actually changed my mind on that. Yeah. I'd heard a really good teaching on that and was convinced. And now, looking at the biblical evidence, I think actually no, all believers throughout history, even way back in the Old Testament, they went to heaven straight away. And... Part of it was that I was told that paradise is not the same as heaven. Paradise is a separate place and eventually they were taken to heaven. But where do we actually see that in scripture? Could I back that with scripture? And ultimately I couldn't because there's no passage that differentiates paradise and heaven. But in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, Jesus says, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
Uh -huh. So this is a few decades after the resurrection, and he's still talking about paradise. The tree yeah, of is. life is in paradise. So paradise is where God is, and obviously God's in heaven. That's where his throne is. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, yep. Paul is talking in the third person, as Jewish rabbis often did. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Mm. So Paul's talking about himself. He's, he's equating them, isn't he? He's equating paradise with heaven. Mm. This is after the resurrection. He's saying he went to heaven. He went to paradise. In the body or out of the body, I don't know. And he calls it the third heaven because the skies were called the heavens. So you've got you know, our immediate sky, the first heaven, then you've got the rest of the cosmos, the universe, the second heaven, yep. and then the third heaven, where Paul visited, is where God's throne is. And we've been able to go, you know, planes going throughout the first heaven, yep. man on the moon, we've been to the second heaven, yep. but third heaven, you can only go there if you're a believer. It's the blood of Jesus that gives you access. And Paul visited, and so there we see that heaven and He's paradise linked, are the he? same. He's made them link. So when Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise, he's saying he's going to heaven. But there are a couple of verses that, um, if you read them from a certain angle, suggest otherwise. Uh, you mentioned one, um, what was the one you mentioned? Oh, what, in the car? Uh, just a minute ago, you oh. said, it's uh, in Peter, I think. Oh, is it 2 Peter 3? I think it just popped in my head, but um, one of those little tough, let's have a little look. Are you there, Jack? Two. Might be 1 Peter 3. Might be 1 Peter 3. Uh, Verses 18 to 20. Okay. You can tell I'm not in voice in the wilderness anymore. <laughs> this was in my notes, I hadn't remembered it. Okay. Uh, yeah, go on. Do you want to read it? 1 Peter 3. Okay. Yeah, this one. Yeah, 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he, with a capital H, that's the Lord, went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So where's that, where's the spirits in prison? So first of all, you've got, so some people say, oh, therefore Jesus, he actually, um, went to hell, went to hell yeah. and preached to spirits who were in prison because in the days of Noah they were disobedient. And we don't have time to go through that chapter of Peter, but number one, it doesn't really follow the argumentation of Peter. And number two, why would he go to hell specifically to speak just to the spirits that were disobedient in Noah's day? It would just be a bit random, it doesn't really fit. What would be the point of saying that? What he's actually saying is he's comparing Noah's day to their day. And Wayne Grudem puts it best. I've stolen this from him, but he really explains the whole passage in context. And he was saying that in Noah's day and in Peter's day, to the believers he's encouraging, there was a righteous minority. They were surrounded by hostile believers. They were awaiting judgment. And in Noah's day, it was the flood. Now, the New Testament believers are waiting for the return of Christ when he will judge the world. Yeah. And he's encouraging them to witness boldly, just like Noah witnessed boldly. And he's saying, and Noah was ultimately saved and they will too. That's the argumentation in the passage. And he's saying, Jesus is saying that he was preaching through Noah by the power of the Spirit, and he can preach through us by the power of the Spirit today. So that's yes. the comparison he's making. So these spirits are now in prison, but when they were preached to, that was when they were on the earth being disobedient in the days of Noah. Okay. That's what it's saying. I've got you. Brilliant stuff. Okay, this is uh, an interactive show, so if you want to text us through and email us through, you're more than welcome, and um, we will get you involved in the show. So let's have a little, let's have a little look now. All good stuff. Okay, Jess says, hi Mark, so sorry to hear the news about the London taxis. Black cabs matter. They certainly do, Jeff, but I fear it is too late, my friend. I fear it is too late. Bless you, Jeff. Um, OK, Sally says, Dear Mark and Jack, uh, I just pray regarding the American election simply that the man of his choice, capital H-I-S, uh, will be elected. He, the Lord, is king, Jack. He is sovereign, and whoever is elected, it's for his purposes, and this is what we must remember. 
Daniel 221. I thank God for you both and for this program. That's our little friend Sally. Thank you, Sally. Yes, it is. Uh, it's all happening out there. It's going to be. It's going to be a tight one. But Jack, that brings us comfort, doesn't it? Knowing that God is sovereign and involved in every affair of man. Yeah. What yeah. is the verse in Daniel? It says. Oh, um, the you quoted Daniel 221. Is that the one? Do you want to have a quick look there now? Daniel 2. That's probably it. Yeah. Daniel 221. You'll probably find it quicker than me. Go on, you have a. Daniel 2.21 says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Yeah. There's also another one that's mentioned quite a lot in Daniel where it says how the Most High is active in the affairs of men. Ah. It's not exactly that wording, but it's yeah. more or less that. Yeah. And because Daniel talks a lot about kingdoms and kingdoms raising and empires oh, being empires destroyed. And, and, yep. um, and he's basically saying, God is involved. I remember once a, a girl at university said to me, oh, I believe in God, but I think he created the world and then just stepped back and let us get on with it. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you, like, she obviously didn't read the Bible. That was just her personal opinion. But especially reading Daniel, you see God is active. Yeah. And God is active in the American election. I don't know exactly what his will is, but I know for believers, all things work together, so we don't need to fear. Amen, Jack. I love that one. Absolutely. Um, Evening, Mark and Jack. It's from Anita. Hi, Anita. It's always lovely to see you both. I watched your last God Day, Mark and Jack. They were both wonderful. You're so relaxed and natural when you speak that it feels as if we're having a chat with you. Bless you, Anita. Jack gets out from his wonderful dad. It's amazing. It amazes me that Jesus could ask for forgiveness for those who did such terrible things to him. We're all sinners and we're so lucky to have our Saviour. I feel that every day, Anita. Literally unworthy. I see dark days ahead, but I'll follow the light and it shines brighter than anything that the enemy can throw at us. That's true, Jack, isn't it? Mm. You know, the darkness cannot comprehend or overcome the light. And the more light we ingest, the more light we know, the harder it is to extinguish. We will gain the ultimate prize if we stand firm. How can we fail when he gave us, gave so much for us? Even on the cross, he brought comfort to the faith. How about that, Jack? That's, that's almost untenable, that idea, isn't it? Mm. A man that deserved to be there, and he <laughs> brought comfort to him. Oh, well, um, who recognised that he was the son of God. We are blessed. God bless you both, everyone at Rev, and all the viewers. Much love from Anita. Thank you, Anita. Wonderful. And I want to say thank you to our lovely viewer in Scotland, the lady that emailed in and said she watched my little God Day while she was cooking her, doing her cooked breakfast, Jack. And she really got a lot out of it. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I don't get time to reply, but it really made me smile. Really made me smile. OK, Jacko, number three. Should we go there? Yeah, so in John 19, verses 26 to 27, Jesus says to Mary and to John, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And what's happening there is he's on the cross and there's a group of faithful women there who had followed him, and just one of his apostles had followed him, which was John, who's called the disciple that Jesus loved. And he's basically saying, Mary, John is now your son, and John, Mary is now your mother. Because we think Joseph isn't mentioned barely at all in the Gospels, only at the very beginning, so he's probably dead. And it was Jesus' duty to look after his mother, and because he's dying, he's given the duty over to John. And it just struck me how you know, some people are very spiritual and they only think about heaven. And the Pharisees are an example of this, but a bad example where it's the verse that mentions Corban, which is basically, oh, yeah. they're supposed to give parents... Even, even Jeremy got into the New Testament, didn't he? <laughs> I was thinking that, yeah. <laughs> um, but they were supposed to look after their elderly parents and instead of giving money to them, they just give it to the synagogue and say it's, it's Corban. So they're supposed to look after the parents but they try and spiritualise it and instead just give money to the temple. And it is not like that. Jesus was focused on the kingdom of God. He says, my kingdom is not of this world, yet he did not forsake his earthly duties. Mm. And we should be the same. Jesus made sure his mum was all right, that John was going to look after her. And even Paul in, I think it's in Galatians, let me find the verse. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, uh, this is in the context of evangelism, him being sent to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, and he says, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So even though they're bringing the gospel to all these different groups of people, they still want to remember the poor, 
help those in need. Um, often it's just liberal Christians who are very light on the gospel, not so focused on Bible teaching. They just want to do good things. And then sometimes we can think, no, let's just preach the gospel. It's all we need to do. But actually we need to preach the truth and the whole of biblical truth. But actually we need to love each other as well. And, and in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, you can have all these spiritual gifts and all this knowledge, but if you don't have love, it's, you're just a clanging symbol. Absolutely, So yes. we need to strike the balance there. There's an old saying, isn't there, that people, some people are so, what is it, heavenly minded that they're no, do you know what the next bit is? They're no earthly good. Okay. So it's no point us, you know, uh, becoming a monk and hanging about in a cave somewhere, you know, uh, waiting for the rapture and talking to no one and flagellating yourself with a whip and trying to, uh, you know, just doing nothing at all but trying to uh, be whatever holy is, you know. Love needs an outworking. Love worked in needs, needs an object to be loved, you know. And do you know what, Jack? It's, we, yes, we need the word, we need the scriptures, we need good doctrine, we need to know what we're on about, you know. Uh, but we need to be relevant, and that's relevant to our friends, our family. You know, I had a lovely little chat today with uh, someone who lives very close to us, might even be watching now, and you can tell that the Lord is just quickening their spirit about salvation and the end. They're, you know, they, I think they're quite concerned. And it was great just to have a little 10 minute witness there. The Lord was, you know, was speaking hopefully through me and hopefully I shed some light to this, this person, you know, and hopefully they, they could find some hope because you could just see a little sense of slight despair about what's going on. Um, and obviously, if you're in the world and you've rejected the Lord, this is a living nightmare, you know. But we can see that the, we can see what's going on through this situation at the moment, and we can see Christ working through it. So, don't sit in a cave. Don't sit there talking to yourself, waiting for the Lord to take you home. Occupy, Jesus said, occupy till I come. Get on with your job, whether you're a dustman, driving instructor, you know, policeman, whatever you do, get on with your job and go and be Christ. Go and be salt and light to a dying people and a dying world who are looking now for answers more than ever, more than ever. So go and be love in action, um, backed up by the word. Thanks, Jacko. Any other little nuggets on that little scripture? Um, well, we know that John was faithful and in the next verse we read, it's John 19, 27, and from the hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And this is a disciple it was the Apostle John. He wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote his three letters. So this is like a big name. And all the Christians that ever existed, he's in the top tier, yet he was still willing to look after this, I don't know how old she was. Oh, maybe not quite elderly. Yeah. Um, but this woman who's not even related to him, he was willing to look after her. So even if you're a big name preacher, you might be a pastor, doesn't matter who you are, you need to show love. You need to support one another. Amen, Jack. I like that one, mate. Absolutely do. Brilliant stuff. Right, should we go on to number four? Yes, number four is in Matthew 27, verse 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are Jesus' words on the cross. And earlier we said how the New Testament is the fulfilment of Old Testament scripture. Jesus didn't come out of nowhere and say, let's start a new religion. He says, all of the scriptures, Moses and the prophets, they all speak of me. And if you read the New Testament, you see countless Old Testament references. And here he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Do you know what, Jack? You're just starting to whet my appetite. Um, Mum and I visited Pastor Derek uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a little, a little a night away in near Aylesbury, and we popped into Derek and Hillary. And, uh, oh, by the way, guys, when you see Derek uh, on the Q&A, and he's in that little room surrounded by about 8,000 books, believe me, there's about 8 million books in there. <laughs> I did laugh when I walked in there. He's got about 8 million books on every subject under the sun, and uh, it, it did, it was great, absolutely great. But he gave, gave me a lovely little book to read by, um, what's his name, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. You've, you've heard about him, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Who's a Messianic Jew, and it's um, about Messianic Christology and how the Old Testament uh, with the, the law, the writings, the prophets, points to the coming Christ as the fulfilment in those three books. And boy, is it deep. It is an absolute revelation. And Jesus did turn up, Jack, didn't he? He didn't turn up out of the blue. Um, King David, when, it, when he wrote Psalm 22, was about a thousand years before Christ even came into, into action. Uh, silly phrase that, but appeared on the earth. And crucifixion hadn't even been invented 
as a form of, of death at the time. And it appears in there, that Jack, doesn't it? Psalm 22, my God, my God, yeah. why have you forsaken me? It even says, they've pierced my hands and my feet. Why would you write that? Yes. Especially if crucifixion hadn't even been invented it yet. Hadn't. It's so the mind of God, he inspired, is it David, I think, to write this? Yeah, Psalm of David. And Psalm 22, along with Isaiah 53, are probably the biggest messianic passages in the Old Testament, where you just read it and think, that is Jesus. That is definitely Jesus. And in Psalm 22, verse 1, we read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And these are his words that he spoke on the cross. He says, Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? And Jesus had enjoyed perfect fellowship with God the Father forever. And you see that especially in John. He calls himself the Son and God is his Father. And they want to stone him because they say, by saying this, you're making yourself equal with God. And he was equal with God. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, he's taking the wrath of God on the cross. God is pouring out all of his anger about sin, all of this judgment onto Jesus. And you've got the physical pain of crucifixion, which would have been excruciating. You've got the social pain of all those closest to you, almost, have abandoned you and run away out of fear. And then you've got the psychological, spiritual pain of taking all the sin on the cross, where Jesus detested sin so much. And he says in John that the Father has given me judgment. It's Jesus who's going to judge the earth. It's Jesus who will throw people into the lake of fire for being wicked sinners. He hates sin so much, and yet he's on the cross taking our sin. He became a curse for us. It says in Galatians and 2 Corinthians, Chapter 5 says he became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And from the perspective of the Romans and the Jews, they're probably thinking, oh, this man is just cursed of God. Yeah. This man is stupid. He's come with all this message and now look at him. He can't even save himself. And the great thing about this psalm, it's Psalm 22, is that at the beginning you see how Jesus is forsaken and he's suffering and he's in pain. And then nearer the end, you start to see actually... This story isn't a miserable story, it ends positively. And, I mean, there's quite a lot of good verses you could use here for the resurrection. But in verse 21, it says, Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. And... He goes on to say in verse 24, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. And in verse 27, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And it's worth reading the whole psalm in your own time. But we see that transition from suffering and pain and being abandoned to actually know God has delivered me, he has saved me, and I will sing his praises forever, and all of the nations shall come and worship him. And that is what has happened. I mean, look at the world today. Christianity is the biggest religion, and obviously a lot of it is, is not true Christianity. It's not true relationship with God. But Christianity has spread all the way to England from Israel. We're here now, followers of Jesus. It has happened exactly what you said. Jesus suffered but then he also rose again. He had the victory in the end. He had the last laugh he did. over Satan. Wonderful stuff. You know, Jack, what you said a couple of minutes ago about it, it, it worries me that certain pseudo-Christian cults always try and um, bring the Lord down from deity, all right? He, he was not God in flesh. And, but the people that were there at the time, the Pharisees, it was blazingly obvious we're going to stone you because you've what? You've made yourself equal with God. I mean, do you know what? I'd rather take it from the people that were there at the time and that were stoning him because it was blasphemy. He was making himself, he, he was making himself God. Before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. He knew what he was doing, you know? Yeah. That man, that Lord Jesus Christ got stoned because he was saying, I am. Mm. Amazing stuff. And I love the passage just very quickly in, at the end of John where Jesus has risen from the dead. He's come back and Timothy's saying, I won't believe until I see his wounds 
And then he sees Jesus, he sees his wounds, he touches them and he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Love that one. That is how we should think of Jesus as our Lord and God. Amen. Brilliant stuff. Email time. Brian always comes in with some absolute nuggets. I read, Brian, last week's one I read after the show. Fantastic. Brian says, uh, great insight, Mark and Jack. Were you suggesting that when Jesus preached to those in prison, it would have been, as you said, that Noah did when Noah was yet alive before the flood? That was what Jesus did within the three days before he rose or within the 40 days when he was alive again before he ascended and perhaps, or perhaps both, question mark. It's always been a difficult one for me. Thank you, Brian. Brian, it's out of my league, mate. I literally... Do you know, one thing I, one thing I started to realise um, as you get older and in the faith, actually, the less you know. And I've become... I've actually become less... far less dogmatic uh, about certain positions. I was chatting to Brother Jeremy um, uh, this week and... You get to the point where you have so many conversations with yourself trying to form certain opinions and it gets, it's, let the Lord speak to you, let the Lord minister to your spirit, truth is truth, but you'll find as you walk with the Lord, you're, you're open, okay, you are open, there are different ways of seeing things and maybe I'm just getting a bit of an old dinosaur, but Brian, great little, great little text there. But also just to clarify and answer his question, um, the preaching that Jesus did was through Noah, through Noah when they were being disobedient. So it's talking about the spirits who are now in prison, yeah. but the preaching was when they were on earth being disobedient. Yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Cheers, Brian. Uh, Sheila says, evening Mark and Jack, there's food for thought. What else did Jesus say? I've always considered that what was recorded at the cross was all that Jesus said at that time. Quite troubling that we don't know. Do we know therefore all that we need to know? Thank you for another engaging discussion. Thank you, Sheila. Do you know what? If it's there, it's all we need to know. Maybe he said more. Maybe, do you know what? Maybe I he doubt he said loads. He's taken yeah. all the wrath of God on the cross. Yeah, he's, no, he's not really one in the mood for yeah. a chat, to be honest. Yeah, do you know what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, evening, Mark and Jack. Many thanks always for your excellent programme. Refreshing, sound doctrine. Read the cross. The late Barry Smith. I love Barry. Do you know what? He could read the weather forecast, Barry, and just be entertaining, couldn't he? who has often had his end-time messages repeated on Rev, once said that at the start of his ministry, he was advised by one of his wise mentors that when preaching, quote, begin at the cross and finish at the cross. Whatever else you preach in between is just academic. That's lovely. Another recent quote I heard, but cannot recall the source was, um, as you move closer to the cross, you move closer to home. Every blessing and shalom in Yeshua, Leslie and Marianne, <laughs> the, Ch the Cheltenham too. Thank you, the Cheltenham too. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Hi, gents. Is it in Daniel that it says, this generation will not pass away uh, from the formation of the state of Israel in 48? Hope so. I was born in 48. Blessings from Jill. Bless you, Jill. It's in the Gospels, isn't it? This Matthew 24. Matthew, isn't it? And maybe Mark and Luke as well. Yeah, I think they yeah. did say it as well, didn't they? Oh, Jill, I think we're, as we say, we're in the business end of history. It's really, really exciting. Phil says, first time I'm tuning into the show, listening to you both is a great encouragement. Thanks, Phil. Brilliant stuff. We do our best and we have a few laughs along the way. God bless you, Phil. Uh, Sue says, hi Mark and Jack, great program. I believe Jesus fulfilled scripture as the first fruits. That's the first person to ascend to heaven. So the Old Testament saints, uh, brackets before the cross, went to paradise. That was a holding place till Jesus' resurrection when paradise was then transferred to heaven. Bless you. Thank you, Sue. Great little text. Good stuff. But that can't quite be right, actually, because uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the rapture, it's called the first fruits. And if you talk about a rapture passage, it's always the first fruits. So it's not the person, the first person to go to heaven, yeah. but the first person to actually rise from the dead, rise from heaven and come back to earth. Because when we're raptured, okay, yep. we're raptured so we can reign with Christ for a thousand years in yeah. Revelation 20. He actually came back to so earth. He, he's the first fruits because he rose back and came back to earth, yes. risen from the dead in a new body. And he, if he's the first fruits, we will also at a later point come back, rise from the dead, from heaven, come back to earth. Brilliant stuff. Jack. Just running short on time. Do you know what? An hour's not long enough, is it? It, it, yeah. it just isn't. Let's steam in because you do put some work in. I'll, I'll try and be quick. So, number, number five. Number five. John 19, 28, Jesus simply says, I thirst. Yes, and there's not so much insight into this, but one important thing to say is that it fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Two verses into the, in the Psalms, it's, the Messiah says, My tongue sticks to my jaws. And in Psalm 69, for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And that's what happened. He was thirsty and they offered him wine. And at the beginning of his time on the cross, he refused it. But then right at the end, he accepted it. 
And it's, you can't be 100% dogmatic as to why, but I think probably because he had two more very important things to say, to say and he wanted just a bit of strength and he wanted to be able to wow. declare it, because for the next two it says he cried out. So he's really saying these, their declarations, and one of them, this is number six in the list, he says in Luke 23, verse 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So earlier I said that he went to heaven, because he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, which is heaven. And he's saying here, he's given his spirit to the Father. He's going to be with the Father in heaven. And that is also a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in the Psalms, because this is so biblical in, in the Old Testament sense, everything he's doing. And Stephen also prays a similar prayer. When Stephen is being stoned in Acts oh, 7, yes. yeah. he says, um, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So Jesus prayed that prayer and went to be with the Father. And you know, if he's gone to be with the Father, we can as well, because he's paid off our debt, he's paid our fine, we can go there, um, because we are fully righteous now, because he's given us his righteousness. So we're forever indebted, and all he wants is our worship and our lives. Bless you, Jack. Oh. Uh, we've got one more, haven't we? So it, we're still, we've got time. We've got about eight minutes now, Jack. Uh, I prefer to call it uh, the rapture, the resurrection of the dead, as the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are left will be caught up to meet them and the Lord in the air, etc. Uh, if people seem to ignore this fact of resurrection day. Blessings to you both. Keep up the good work, both of you. Christine. Thank you, Christine. I can't wait to get out of here, but not before until the Lord has finished with, with me. I, I want to do my full, full race. Yes, I'm looking forward to my heavenly home, Jack. But uh, I want to I wanna do what the Lord has put me on this earth to do. Hi, Mark and Jack. Great show, guys. Um, oh, check this one out. Frankie Belfast. Isaiah 49, 16. Behold, I have engrave, engraved you on the palms of my hands. Keep shining bright, champs. Frankie from Belfast. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Frankie. Needed that. Um... Hi, watching you at the moment. Thought it was Doubting Thomas that wanted to see Jesus' wounds, not Timothy. Oh, Matty. Thanks, Matty. Maybe we mispronounced oh, If I that. said Timothy, I yeah. didn't mean that. Timothy weren't on the scene until quite yeah, a while Timothy. later. It was Doubting Doubt Doubt Thomas. Doubting Thomas. <laughs> and do you know what? Doubting Thomas is one of my favourites because it just it makes you feel a bit better when you're having a doubting moment, doesn't it, Jack? You know? Do you have many doubting moments? To be honest, no. <laughs> no. I, uh, I actually I have a strong faith, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, doesn't always you know, live in accordance with my repentance. No, you don't, because my never faith is tea, do you? So, <laughs> that, you know, your faith doesn't come out in your works yet, because we're still waiting for that cup. Faith comes by <laughs> hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the, the more time you spend in the word, yeah. God will grow your faith more and more. So yes. if, if you feel like you've got a feeble faith, spend time in the word and it will definitely grow. Do you know what it does? Because I was reading Hosea, literally, as I was saying, and I thought, I'm not going to get anything out of this. This is heavy judgment on Israel and Judah. And... The Lord quickened me. Absolutely brilliant, you know? Absolutely great stuff. Jack, we're down to our last few minutes. Our last one. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. And this is probably the most, Im most important. Uh, John 19.30. We will, we will do a little subtitle called Triumph because Jesus said, it is finished. How about that, yeah. Jack? The redemptive work of the Saviour, the redeeming back from the slave market of his people, has now been fulfilled, job done. Yeah. Then he breathed his last and gave up his spirit, didn't he? It is finished. What little nuggets you got out of it is finished? Well, I was looking up the word in the Greek, and it's a word used in like business and finance to say that the debt has been paid in full. And I thought that's such a wonderful way of looking at it. Our sin debt, which we could never pay off, you know, we'd be, we would be burning for eternity. There would never come to the point where we've paid off our sin debt we've sinned against an eternal God. But Jesus paid it for us. And now we can say our debt has been paid. We don't owe anything anymore. So we don't have to go and spend thousands of years in purgatory, as, as some people claim. That's not biblical. We don't have to spend the rest of our lives, you know, whipping ourselves, trying to make ourselves right with God. No, we are right with God if we're believers. And our debt has been paid and we can have complete assurance. And that is why Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not forgiven us 80% and we've got to do the rest. No, he's done 100%. We don't need to do the rest. He's done it all. And in Hebrews 7, verse 25, it says, he is able to save to the uttermost 
those who draw near to God through him. So Jesus saves us completely and fully because our debt has been completely paid. And that's such a wonderful thing to think about with all the stuff going on in the world. And you might be loads in debt now, especially if you're not able to work and you might not have received money from the government. You might think, how am I going to pay off 30 grand debt? And then you think, actually, there was a worse debt, my sin debt, yeah. and that has been completely paid. So rejoice whatever situation you're in. Yeah. We can always rejoice. Wow. Thanks, Jack. Good little text here. Hi, guys. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10 speaks of Jesus leading captivity captive. I've, I've always been intrigued by that line. So he went down into the earth before going to the Father, and many were seen alive who had died. That's talking about Jesus descending from heaven to earth, not descending from earth to hell. So he came down to earth, and most, especially in the modern translations, make that clear, the ESV makes that clear, the NIV, these lower regions are the earth. He descended down to the earth, yeah. and then he descended up again uh, to be in heaven. Bless you, Jack. His ascension. Mark and Jack, thank you for your wisdom and teaching of the word. Enjoyed tonight's teaching. Thank you for sowing the word and the encouragement. God bless you always in Jesus' name. Karen, God bless you, Karen. Do you know what? If we can inspire you just to carry on another day, one day at a time, that's all, that's all we need, isn't it? Uh, hi, brothers. That Jesus, in his painful, pressurised, very difficult situation on the cross, could three times reach out to others is so revealing. He gave his life wholeheartedly for others, and he's still the same. Thanks for the interesting program from Eva. Eva's got a good insight there, Jack, hasn't she? To be in that much, I mean, we can't even remotely, not even imagine it, mm. and yet he still was up there loving in the most extremes of extremis, you know? You got all quiet, Jack, you're all right. Oh, no, I was just letting you get oh, through yeah. the emails. Oh, okay, yeah. So I was thinking while you were saying that, the cross shows both his great love and his judgment. You know, if God wasn't a God of judgment against sin, he wouldn't need to punish his son in our place. But he's also a God of love. He loves us so much that he was willing to come down, like in Ephesians, from heaven to earth. And in Ephesians 2, it takes, and not even just that, the lowest position, even death on a cross. Yeah. That is how much he loves us. Thank you, Jack. Tony's come here with one... Uh, Really heartrending. Hi, both with it's great guys. We put that Isaiah scripture you just read out engraved on the palm of my hands on our window. It cost us our home. The landlords kicked us out when our neighbours just complained a few weeks ago. The cost can be high, truly high. God bless, Tony. Wow, Tony. Um, wow, that is, is. We look at this and, and the cost is tremendous. It's truly high and. Tony, the only, I, I've got no words of real softness or encouragement for you there. That is a, a, a dire situation. And I, I pray the Lord will, will supply every need. Uh, and the cost can be, Jack. We, in the West, we've had it easy for a while. Well, a very long while, really. You know, and our fellow brothers and sisters around the world have paid truly high costs. I do believe those days are now slowly drawing to a close, you know. And we are going to be made to make choice very soon, it's either the true God of the Bible, not, not a vague, nebulous, liberal Jesus God that you know, doesn't intrude on people's lives. This is the true God of the Bible. It actually says, you've got to make a choice. There's, there's no more fence sitting. I hope, hopefully you can make a choice from tonight's little program with myself and Jack, and hopefully you make the right choice that um, the Lord Jesus Christ paid your sin debt in full, and he wants to pay it for you, but you just have to turn to him in penitence and in faith with a contrite spirit, and he'll never, ever turn you away. I have no idea what myself and Jack will be talking about next week. By the grace of God, we'll be here Wednesday. Take care, look up, your redemption draws nigh.